I'm going to be the chair for this afternoon. Um, it's already Saturday afternoon and I'm pretty happy to see so many people still here. It's a nice day out. Uh, Santa is coming soon. And uh, Actually, when I was uh, asked by Brett to chair a session, I said yes, didn't know there was going to be on a Saturday afternoon. But uh, to see that there's so many people, uh, next, uh, next symposium, if you want me to chair, and it's a Sunday evening at 10 p.m., sign me on. It's been a very great symposium, and I'm very happy that uh, I join in, and we are all here today for this, uh, for this session. We have two speakers, and I will uh, moderate those uh, two talks uh, for the next uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Mastro Monaco from the Toronto Zoo. Uh, she's been introduced yesterday uh, because she was at the round table in the morning, so I'm going to limit my introduction and rather read a, a memo that I received this morning from uh, uh, Mr. Harper, our Prime Minister. <laughs> Dear Extension Thinker, uh, I've noticed and have been aware that the panda of the Toronto Zoo have been the focus of many talk during your conference. Uh, I'd like to precise that this is my own responsibility, and Dr. Master Monaco is not responsible at all for that choice, <laughs> and many of the other contested choices that I've made uh, for my mandate. So in doing so, she's a free researcher, her job is secure, and she will present you today her work not related to the panda, but to the reproduction, all the reproduction that she's doing uh, at the zoo. In fact, some people might call her the Sue Johnson of wildlife. Uh, every question you can have about the sex life, whether it's about lizards, snakes, turtles, uh, birds, and other mammals, she will be able to answer those questions. And uh, it's been a pleasure to have her here. It's her third visit. In fact, she works with a few of us here at Laurentian, uh, Dr. Schulte Ostede, Dr. Lizgus, myself, and our students. And we're happy, very happy to have you again today. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I, I do want to thank the organizers of this symposium for thinking outside the box and, and thinking that I needed to be here to present some of what we do. So I do feel I've been nervous for like two days leading up to this. So this is my moment of truth. I felt a little bit like the sacrificial lamb and uh, mostly because I'm going to be talking about something very different. I'm a biotechnologist and I don't have my team from the zoo behind me. We're, we're a huge team of people that work together, but the conservation biologists, the curators and the others are not here to kind of sell the other part of the story at the zoo. So anyways, what I'm gonna teach you a little bit about today is reproduction, the science of it, the technology, of it and maybe you'll come away with two things one I'm really hoping that you understand a little bit better when a really um, you know a, a news piece hits the press and it sounds really incredulous maybe I've given you a little bit of background to understand that and two the real role that we're we're playing uh, in our ex situ programs so enough rambling for that okay I'm not even gonna mention this but I needed a slide to start you guys know all of this I'd be totally preaching to the crowd we have a biodiversity crisis. We all know that. And I wanted to say that there are some amazing people working uh, at different levels. So whether it's the habitat restoration, preservation, the people on the ground, uh, the, the people working hard trying to buy land, reserve land, and communicate with locals. Then there's the other group of people that are doing the in situ conservation. Again, the hardcore, the wildlife biologists, and they're all doing amazing work. And unfortunately, I don't work in either of those areas. I work with ex situ populations. So I'm gonna give you a little insight on what that means, what it is that we do, and maybe um, I'm hoping you walk away with a slightly different um, opinion of zoos. But if not, don't worry, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about what ex situ conservation means. They, they're captive populations. The new word is to say in human care. I don't like that because if you string it together, in human care, 
not so good. So I'm old school, You're, I, I continue talking about populations in captivity or captive populations. And there's different kinds. I'm, I'm not going to um, say that we don't display animals because they're cute and fuzzy. They bring people in the door. We have outreach animals that we use for little kids for education purposes. There's all of that. There's a retail end to zoos. There has to be, um, but I won't be discussing that. But then there are other populations that we hold um, that are kind of near and dear to us, and this is why we all work there. One are the insurance populations. These are animals that are critically endangered. Their numbers are very low, and, and we're just holding on to them. What is going to be done with them? We don't always know, but if we have the space for them, uh, then we try to keep the genetics viable and the animals viable. So this is just a very small number, some examples. And I try to um, be fair because I do deal with all taxa at the zoo. That's 5,000 animals that are under my care. Um, I try to do a bit of everything. You see reptiles. I try to include birds. And the only thing I don't do is insects, but uh, sorry about that. Um, but the <laughs> any entomologists here? But... Uh, but then there are another group of animals that without zoos would, wouldn't, wouldn't be here anymore. And these are the ones that are extinct in the wild and they are captive dependent species. Whether we're trying to reintroduce them or not, it depends on, on the nature of the species and what is meant for them. But there's 33 of them. Again, I only listed a few of them to not make the list so extensive. There's again mammals and birds and reptiles, amphibians, fish. Uh, everything that you can think of it might be represented on these lists. But in the last 20, 30 years, there have been some, well, I've heard the talks today and yesterday. I was going to say there have been some successes, maybe, maybe not. They were in, reintroduced from an artificial environment into the wild. Is that good or not? I think is up for debate. But anyways, I'm going to tell you what was done no longer extinct in the wild, and there's a number of other ones, but again, I just tried to represent a few of them. The Arabian oryx, Przewalski's horse, black-footed ferret, red wolf, weasant, California condor. These were animals declared extinct. There was barely enough genetics. They were bred out in captivity, and, and enough animals were, were produced that they could be released, and in some cases, they're still what is known as conservation reliant, which means we're either feeding the populations uh, or they depend on our captive numbers at some point. I want to focus on the black-footed ferret because it's the uh, one, the major species that I know of that is in the wild because of assisted reproduction. So even though we're looked at the big bad technology people at the zoo, there are reasons to need us or to use us, and that's what I'm hoping I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So uh, this was the amazing work of Dr. Jo Gail Howard. Uh, she passed away way too early in her career, but she, did, um, she developed a technique to do artificial insemination in very, very small animals. She was pre pretty much the only one in the world that could do it, but she produced many, many offspring uh, using this technique, and, and they're all out back in the wild. And so I always get asked, does artificial insemination screw up the babies? The babies don't care how the sperm got there. It swam, it made it, the babies are all normal. So I'm going to start with that. Um, but moving on, I need to tell you a little bit about conservation breeding programs. Some of you may know this, so I apologize, um, but some of you may not. And if you wonder why would you need a reproductive technology or, or all the zoo scientists that work behind the scenes, because it's of the type of mandate that we work under. So based on the, uh, uh, the mandate of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, I'm going to read this to you. Our objective is to maintain a healthy, self-sustaining, genetically diverse and viable, as well as demographically stable population of a species in human care. This is the new version. And to organize zoo and aquarium-based efforts to preserve the species in situ. So on paper, that sounds so simple, you know, genetically viable, demographically stable, self-sustaining. Great. The population geneticists have these amazing models. And then we have to try to put that into play with living animals, living beings that want to do their own thing, that don't, don't follow the rules, that didn't read this book. And so I'll show you reasons why uh, we need to uh, maybe intend intensively manage, or manage them more intensively than people would like us to. So the key thing is we have to maintain 90% uh, genetic diversity for 100 years. Originally it was supposed to be 200 years, but uh, that's a really tall order and it's been difficult to, to keep. So we have to make sure we have contribution from all founders, 
maintain a minimum number of animals, every, every species has its magic number, uh, and make sure they're reproductively active. Again, looks really great on paper, but these are the problems. We're zoos, we're zoos with fences, we only have so much space. So space limitation, uh, if you have a very large animal, um, for example, let's say elephants, I shouldn't have brought that up because we're being taped, but um, you might need 400 elephants. It, you might need 5,000 amphibians, but that's great, that fits in the back of my office. But 400 elephants requires a lot of space. So space limitations, we're battling all the time. Genetic diversity, what did we start with? Did all of them breed? What are we left with? We're watching inbreeding coefficients all the time. And of course, reproductive efficiency. So animals, humans are animals. So if humans have fertility problems, animals will have fertility, fertility problems. Whether it's age, whether it's that's just the way they're made, uh, they have a chromosome problem, some other genetic problem, but we need their genetics. So we need to work with all these scenarios. So why do you have, why do we have people like me uh, in zoos? Now, I'm very either courageous or stupid in career choice. I'm, my position's the only one in Canada. The Canadian government is not really interested in investing in some of the things that we do. But around the world, there's many reproductive biologists and technologists working in zoos. In the 1994 meeting of the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group of the IUCN, it was decided that the efficiency of intensive conservation efforts can be increased by applying recent advances in reproductive technology. So it was in the early 90s that they looked at the techniques that were being used in domestic animals and humans and realized we can benefit from this and put it to work for us. Recently, just a, a year or so ago, they started to make a huge push towards the frozen ark, which is the cryobanking of specimens around the world. Now, I'm not going to use the word the frozen zoo, neither should anyone else. It's been trademarked by San Diego and can't be used unless we're discussing their cryobank. So it's the San Diego frozen zoo. The rest of us have genome resource banks <laughs> in nice genetic form. but. A generic form. So I'm going to first start with the, the whole idea of the frozen arc and then move to the reproductive technologies. The reason for that is a lot of the work I do, something's got to be in a frozen state at some point because the animal's not always beside me. So we need to really focus on cryobiology and cryobanking before we invest too much in a species. So let's talk a little bit about that. Again, in the uh, time allotted, I'm just it's too much of a field to cover, so I'm just going to touch very quickly on things. The Frozen Arc pro uh, project was actually established in the UK from a university group, and they set it up as a charitable organization. Their purpose was to collect and preserve cells and DNA from all endangered species. Uh, now, they say in an effort to catalog them for future reference and conservation efforts, because we don't know, they may never be used again, but wouldn't it be great if biologists from the future can pull these cells from tanks and learn a little bit of biology from these cells from the DNA? So some of it may end up being very basic science, but some of it may be used for offspring production. So the Frozen Art Consortium already has 48,000 samples from 22 institution members, and we have to credit the San Diego Zoos. Uh, they're now the San Diego Zoo Global Wildlife Conservancy, their frozen zoo for more than half of those samples. So they were quite visionary. This is under Kurt Benersch and Oliver Ryder, the geneticist. They started in the early 70s. They've been banking for way over 30 years. And they've got um, close to probably 28,000 samples from anything you can think of. Animals that are extinct, uh, they hold in their bank. And of course, London, uh, the group in Germany, South Africa, there's my bank at Toronto Zoo. We're kind of spread all around the world. And there's an image of, so I, I'm not talking about people who may work with an endangered species at a university and they decided to bank their sperm. I'm talking about people who are systematically banking species as part of their mandate. Uh, that's why you see so many, uh, so few of us around the world. Now the difference between us and some other programs that I'm gonna discuss in a second is our mandate is to bank cells in living form. It's great to take a piece of tissue and slap it in your minus 80 freezer, but that's not gonna help anyone. Uh, in the future. So it's, um, it's easier said than done to cryopreserve things. It's quite a technology in itself, um, but we work hard at doing sperm, oocytes, embryos, somatic cells or other cells of the body, and tissue pieces if that's all we have available to us. 
Now, I'm going to bring the next two slides up because I'm going to tell you a little bit about my program. My program has me and two of my staff that work hard and a total budget that comes from the zoo's entrance gate of a quarter million a year. So it funds our salaries and um, my $30,000 a year operating budget that I make all of this happen on. But 10 years ago, the government, the federal government decided that it is oh so important to bank um, endangered livestock breeds in Canada. They hired three scientists. They're, they used $2 million to set up the lab and they have $750,000 a year as operating budget to go across Canada banking cattle and pigs and sheep and goats that are Canadian specific breeds that might go extinct in the next uh, decade. Um, so see the difference there. So I've tried to approach them and say, you know, can we just have a little bit, like another 25000 a year, I'm good as gold. But there's no interest, there's no economic value in my bank compared to theirs. I'm going to take it one step further. I love Paul Bear in Guelph, but he gets a lot of money. And I, I want to say to him, but I'm banking the cells in living form. You're banking the sequence just uh, 100 little base pairs that are floating in a computer. But this is just all I could find last night. He's got over 50, 100 million dollars, but over the next 10 years. So it's a, one, it's a fad. Sequencing is so amazing. The barcode of life, it's so amazing. I agree, we need to catalog and identify all the species, but it would be so great if in just, instead of just taking whatever sample blood, if they were thinking of living cells, and then we could both benefit from this. But so, Right away, you just see the perspective, economic, so what I call a technological fad, an economic importance, and then a conservation importance right at the bottom. I'm not bitter, really. <laughs> but, so, leaving the, the cryobanking aside, again, each of these could be our lecture, so I'm quickly going to try to teach you everything about reproduction in, in 30 minutes or less. All right. That's my time, okay. So I, I put this up here so that you can understand that uh, the, the kind of the spectrum of things that we work with. So at the top of the spectrum, the least invasive, the least complex and the least costly to us is the, most of the work we do. So I run two labs at the zoo. One is called endocrinology and the other one's gamete biology where we do all the sperm and embryos and in vitro fertilization. And I would say that one gets 20% of all our attention and our work because it's very expensive, it's very invasive, and you really need to know a lot about the species that you're working with in order to do those technologies. Whereas in my endocrinology lab, it's about 80% of the research and the service work that we do is coming out of that lab. It's basic hormone analysis. Um, we can do it from species all over the world. We're the only lab in Canada that is capable of running serum, urine, fecals. We now do hair, feathers, um, snake sheds, and a variety. We're testing turtle claws now. There you go. <laughs> So um, we really think outside the box. So what do we do? We do reproductive and stress hormone assessments for all our animals at the zoo and zoos across Canada. Remember, I'm the only lab, so I service Calgary Zoo, Assiniboine Park, Granby. Uh, whoever needs my help, I do it. Um, I try to do it at no cost if I can. Uh, within zoos, but then there's also all the uh, university-based researchers that are looking at wildlife populations, and I offer a service to them in different capacities. So, um, advantage, oh, well, let me go back. A anyways, as you can see here, right at the bottom of it is uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer. That's the real terminology. That's the scientific way of saying cloning. We never use the word cloning. I'll t talk about that in a bit because they're not clones except for identical twins. Um, but what you're going to see from my examples is that there's a lot of work being done at the top end and very little work being done at the bottom end of that spectrum. Okay, why, why do we do this? What are the advantages for us? Bottom line is dissemination of genetics, is to try to you know, overcome all the inbreeding coefficient problems we're having, the fact that, um, uh, so going down the list, do we have to keep 400 elephants in captivity? Can we keep 100 elephants and the rest is in the bank? Uh, you know, over the 100 years. So do we have to keep all the living animals uh, that we're holding in zoos? So that's great for you guys, because then we have less animals in zoos and, and more in the bank. 
Um, to eliminate the transport of live animals, yeah, it's really great when it's a chameleon, not so great when we're shipping rhinos. So every, every fall, the zoos make all their breeding recommendations and Air Canada starts and all the animals get shipped around the world for the breeding. So we're trying to eliminate that part of breeding. To avoid disease transmission, this has become a really huge um, topic, especially since Canada broke with mad cow. Who, who would have known? It would be us. Usually we're looking at South Africa and saying, oh, they have tuberculosis and food, foot and mouth, and it's their problem. But it's become a North American problem. So shipping sperm and embryos, we can actually disinfect them, and that uh, then there's no problems about quarantine. Uh, to overcome behavioral incompatibility. So if I chose you and you and I gave you 24 hours in a room, doesn't always work. So <laughs> sometimes artificial insemination is the best way. Uh, to overcome fertility problems, and I'll deal with some of these by giving you some case reports. And most importantly, to extend generation intervals. So if an animal, a good example, Vancouver Island marmots, when they first came to the zoo, I was there in the 90s, so you have about six years where they're reproductively active and then they're done. Well, it took, about a, it took us five of those six years to figure them out. And by then they were old and we lost that first generation in captivity almost. So animals with very short generation interval, intervals, it's, um, it's easy if you bank your founders. And that's what the black-footed ferret people did. They banked all the founders. 20 years later, they thawed the sperm from the bank and they inserted that genetic material back into the captive population. You don't have to go back to the wild. If you manage it properly, you never have to go back to the wild. Okay, but you can see by this wonderful graph, this is where you amazing people sit in the green zone and I sit in the red zone where it says worst. So, <laughs> sliding scale of practical, economical, technological input into species conservation. So my own people tell, are telling me I suck. But anyways, <laughs> what it means is that yes, of course, if all species were sitting at the green end of the spectrum, that would be amazing and we could better help them and, and conserve them and preserve them. The thing is that I think less than 30% of all species are sitting in the green zone. The other you know, 40, 50% in the yellow and there's a good 20 sitting in the red zone. So this is a question that I've been trying to absorb in the last couple days. It's for you ethicists and philosophers to tell me, do we give up? And I've heard both, so I was, I was quite amazed by some of the discussion. Uh, do we even let it get to the point where I get involved? You know, I'm hired to do a job and to provide a service. I, I don't necessarily have the answer to that question, but that's where we sit. Okay, so talking about hormone analysis, I put this graph up just to redeem myself a little bit. Uh, and the fact that uh, not only do I work with ex situ populations, 99% of what I do is that, but we do provide a service to, to free ranging populations. So I do a lot of work for Parks Canada, Ministry of Natural Resources, for two reasons. One, I have the technology of this weird hormone analysis. Two, I come cheap. So. Um, I'm probably one third the cost if they were to try to run all these samples themselves. So we um, just this year are helping wildlife biologists uh, understand population health, growth dynamics, again by looking at reproductive and stress hormone analysis. And the good thing is because we use samples that other people consider garbage, guess what, you don't need permits to bring garbage into the country. So we're looking at red wolves in the United States, lizards out of Arizona, I've got reindeer samples coming from Finland and Norway, uh, chinchillas from South America, because it's just pee and poop and CFIA, nobody seems to care about that stuff. And we also don't need a CITES permit, which everyone knows can take a couple years to get. But again, this would be a whole lecture in itself and I, I can't deal with it more today, but I'm happy to, to talk more uh, in person if you like. So what I wanted to show you was, um, and, and this may shock you, how much work is being done in reproductive technologies uh, over the last 20 years. And you'd be surprised at how many offspring have been born and how many are out there in the wild actually. Um, and how much work has been happening uh, in these different species. So pretty much what we do to not reinvent the wheel, every zoo picks a couple of species. So for example, I'd be really uh, silly to you know, make myself a cheetah expert when the National Zoo has done that so well. So we try not to um, uh, 
to waste resources that way. So being a Canadian, I promised, uh, I'm the first Canadian to ever hold this position in Canada. They were always Americans, not that I have an issue with Americans, but I, I made a promise to my zoo that I would look at Canadian species first. And, and once I had some of those programs underway, would I worry about, you know, the cute African mammals and all that? Um, but as you can see, I, I don't, there's more than this. This just gives you an idea that we're doing birds and uh, reptiles, amphibians, marsupials, all sorts of uh, mammal species. Now, people have been mentioning about jargon, so I apologize. I don't have time to describe each and every technique and what it means. What I need you to understand is I'm talking from least invasive to most invasive. Artificial insemination is what it is. The, the female is prepped. Uh, we synchronize her to when we want her to ovulate and, and we deposit the sperm in her reproductive tract. So this is the most natural of the reproductive technologies because the embryo and fetus are fully developing in the female. All right, And there's a little bit of um, you know, sperm selection in that you know, they have to swim to the egg and fertilize and all of that. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about this technology because it has been the most successful one. In the domestic animal world, it's considered the most powerful tool for modification of genetics. Not that that's what we want with our endangered species, but um, the dairy cattle we have today on Earth, it's because of artificial insemination, all right? It, the Holstein as it is today is not the same animal that was 100 years ago. All right, so again, I start with black-footed ferret. It's probably our greatest success um, because of one scientist and her team. What's, so I'm, I always give a little background of why we needed to do it and then the success that came from it. So they had a very small number of founders, 14 I think it was, and on top of that the males had very poor sperm quality. For, for whatever reason, the founders and the F1, F2 generation had very high rates of abnormal sperm and the natural breedings were not resulting in any uh, offspring. And they wanted the genetic contribution of all males because of the 14, I think there was five or six good breeding males. So over the years, now this program since Dr. Howard passed away has stopped, but in the 10 years that she did do it, 10, 15 years, she had 49 pregnancies from 82 inseminations. Now for a cow person, that's, a, you know, that's horrible. You get 80, 90 percent uh, success. But in the zoo world, we're, we're really thrilled when there's one offspring. She was amazing at her technique. Uh, so not only that, she brought uh, the sperm back from the founders that had been frozen in the 80s and understand that in the 80s we didn't really know what we were doing. So the sperm she was working with must not have been of good quality, but she got two pregnancies from that. There have been 139 ferrets born in the 10 years that she worked on this technique. Some are still in captive breeding, some have been released. Um, but. Uh, but it's one of the major reasons that the, the inbreeding coefficients and the genetic diversity of these 14 founders uh, did so well. Okay, koala. And every um, example that I give you, it's got a little something special about it. The black-footed ferret, because so many of those were released into the wild. This one, it's the only example that I'm talking about where artificial insemination has been written into the Australian government's management policy for the koala species. So it's the first time where a government has taken on the technology and said, okay, moving forward, we're going to manage koalas in Australia and around the world using insemination. So they want to be able to manage their genetics properly around the globe and not have to ship animals. So they use both fresh and schooled, uh, cooled sperm. And the amazing thing is, you can see in the bottom there, the koala is awake. It doesn't bother her. Uh, it takes like 30 seconds. No anesthesia required. So they've trained their females uh, for a, uh, an insemination. 32 pouch young have been produced in just under five years or so. So again, an intensive effort by the uh, scientists uh, in Australia. OK, elephants, now you're talking a super mega vertebrate. <laughs> So um, the reason for this is a lot of the animals in captivity are becoming aged. So we're seeing the same reproductive problems that you know, we would have um, if you're pushing 40 and you want to have your first child. I can attest to that. I was 36, and it's not easy. So, um, and then, of course, distribution of genetics. As the Toronto Zoo learned last week, we don't like shipping elephants around North America. So, uh, so to avoid that was a, a huge um, coup on our part. But 
the, the one thing, the reason why elephant insemination took so long to develop is because, I won't disgust you, but the way we do it is you have to insert your arm rectally to ultrasound them. When I first started that 10 years ago, I was up to here with my face up against her butt, and I was nowhere near her ovaries. So God bless the Germans and their ability to, to develop things. Uh, they managed to develop an ultrasound uh, where you put on a vir virtual helmet, and it's got an extension on it, and then you don't have to turn to see your ultrasound screen. That contraption goes for about 50,000, but they're willing to come to your zoo to help you do that. So um, so again, German researchers put all their efforts into this. They developed the, the, the equipment that was required, and we've now had 37 births around the world uh, from fresh or cooled and one from frozen sperm. So again, a, a huge uh, achievement for them. The reason why I put this up there, haven't been a lot of babies born yet, but this is one of the newer projects. It just started in the last uh, decade or so. This is a case where, again, genetic contribution of all founders is required, but it's the first time Dr. Bill Swanson at Cincinnati Zoo went into the wild, collected sperm from wild ocelots and brought it into captivity. I've got some of that sperm in my zoo tank because of CITES issues. He made it as far as Toronto and couldn't get the permits to get some of it into the States. So we're nice to each other. We hold each other's uh, samples. <laughs> Only... <laughs> Only four pregnancies so far, but it, so it's a very different approach where uh, this is the first time where a, assisted reproduction is totally fusing the captive and the wild populations without necessarily bringing the wild animals into captivity. Okay, white rhinoceros, another megavertebrate. There you see the German researchers. I told you, arm right, butt up to your face is the only way you can ultrasound them. Um, but rhinos are a bit smaller than, than elephants. Again, we have an aging population with a negative growth rate. Um, the entire reproductive phenomenon of aging is fa you know, it's fascinating to me, but that would be another lecture. But this is a southern white, yeah. Um, but again, there's reproductive dysfunction, and it's got to do with things like ovarian cysts, endometriosis, the same thing that humans get, these aged rhinos are getting. Uh, and so far, they have put a good decade work uh, into this, and there have been five births from fresh and frozen inseminations around the world. Okay, I'm going to talk about dolphins because um, we tend to forget our marine mammal counterparts sometimes, and I have to give credit, there's an amazing vet at SeaWorld uh, in San Diego, and he has done some amazing work, one to, to, with his staff, of course, none of us works alone, uh, to train the animals to be able to do this. Again, uh, a lot of it done under, um, not under anesthesia. Um, one, to be able to collect the sample, and then two, to be able to inseminate the females. But they went one step above. They used a technology known as uh, sex sorting sperm, where you run sperm through a flow cytometer, you separate the X and the Y bearing sperm. In the case of marine mammals, uh, they need, it's a female dominated group, and they needed to skew the ratio 50 50 to 80 20 in order to, to sustain the population in captivity. And there is a little anecdotal thing that animals born in zoos tend to turn out uh, predominantly male. For example, we're, we've been one of the zoos lucky enough to actually breed Przewalski horses. Of the five offspring born in the last three years, four were males. Our camels, Six offspring born, five were males. That's a different science right there, but it's something about, I don't know, survival, and um, it's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but it's not even 50-50, it's skewed towards the male. So they needed to bring it back skewed towards the female. And in an am amazing, th uh, these people do amaze me, they've had 10 females born from sex-sorted sperm inseminations. So not only did they, they went all the way, not only did they say, we're gonna try to develop a technique to inseminate dolphins, we're gonna sort the sperm on top of it. So um, when I teach to a, a reproductive group, they understand what that means. When you sex sort sperm, you are really um, being hard on the sperm. They've gone through a lot before you inseminate with them. So you have very fragile, very low sperm count, and they were able to overcome all of that. Gotta throw in an amphibian. 
Um, the Wyoming toad was one of the ones I listed as extinct in the wild, but Memphis Zoo, their uh, reproductive person, is one of the only ones in the world who has an interest in reptiles and amphibians, so he's kind of cornered the market here. Uh, toads fail to spawn and spermiate naturally in captivity. They tried to do hormone induction and it wasn't working, so they went to what is, it's not quite artificial insemination because you're doing it outside the body, but uh, as close to it. So you could see in the bottom they're collecting sperm from the male when the female deposits her egg they incubate them together and not only were 2,000 tadpoles born but they were released into the wild so that's the second species where uh, reproductive technologies have actually fed the wild all right now I'm going to move a step higher and I'm going to go quicker. There's not as much to say here. In order to do in vitro fertilization now, I need to really understand the male to get sperm. I need to understand the female to be able to get the oocytes and then I need to be able to grow them in the lab. So that's very difficult to do. We can barely do it well with our domestic animals, let alone with all these species we know nothing about. But again, some works have been, uh, some groups have been working diligently on all these species. But look at the outcomes. Very low, very experimental. Um, the reason why I put the Siberian tiger up there is that work was done in conjunction with Omaha Zoo. These tigers, their mother had been poached uh, in the wild uh, in Russia and the four of them were brought into captivity. So very, very valuable genetics and we wanted to cryopreserve their embryos. And that's why that work started. Again, the ocelot, the same group that's working with the sperm is trying to make embryos to bank. A uh, little bit of work done in the deer species, but, but again, very low pregnancy rates. So now this is becoming very expensive, a little bit invasive, and it takes about a decade to develop the technology, and that's why it's moving so slow. So artificial insemination takes us about five years to develop, uh, in vitro fertilization about 10. Okay, now I'm going to, this is actually my background. I'm a I do somatic cell nuclear transfer as my research program, but uh, I don't ever discuss it, this at the zoo, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, in a bit. As you can see, a lot of, and probably more species than this, I just wrote a chapter for a book, I think I had about 50 species, where somatic cell nuclear transfer has been done. The ones in red are where live offspring have been born. I didn't, I'm not saying they lived, but live offspring have been born. The wolf, the mouflon, the African wildcats, the gar and the ban, uh, not the gar, the banting are still alive. But nobody right now seems to care about nuclear transfer in its true form. They seem to care about it in what's in the news. And Ronald, I think you did a great job. So I'm not going to rehash this. The only thing I wanted to say is that it, it will not be done by zoos. We don't have a mandate to bring animals back from extinction, um, whether they were far, you know, extinct back in the millennia ago or um, yesterday. And the reason for that, I'm, I'm going to give you a great example. Those of us that work with this know a lot about the cells that we work with. If you've only banked cells from one animal, there's really no point cloning it because you have nothing else to breed it to. So it, it wasn't necessarily a waste of resources. That researcher got what he needed from it. He got the million dollars he wanted. He got the fame and fortune. And he has a really thriving cloning lab now. But I did want to explain the science. Sorry about that elephant picture. Uh, I, I wanted to explain the science a little bit because now you're going to look at CBC and go, yeah, I know what they're doing. So in, in order to do a, a cloning project, uh, and I'll tell you why they're not true clones. Why aren't they true clones? Because the oocyte has foreign mitochondrial DNA. So the metabolism of the embryo is different. And these are things that my research program is trying to understand. What's the impact of foreign mitochondrial DNA to the genome. Uh, the other thing is that we know um, to use synthetic chromosomes and all that, well, the only way you can get cloning to work is to synchronize the cell exactly to where you need it to be. And that has to be G0. You can't have it anywhere else in the cell cycle to get a living embryo out of it. So those are little geeky technical things. But So you need to have enough donor cells. You need to have more than one animal in your bank. Uh, you need to have a, um, a related domestic species that can give you the oocytes to use as your recipient. Then you need to be able to grow that embryo in the lab. So we can't grow elephant embryos. Nobody knows how to do that. We can't even take eggs out of elephants or out of their ovaries after they pass away. So we, we can't grow these embryos in the lab. Uh, and then you have to have a recipient female. So you have to understand her cycle, how to embryo transfer the embryo back into her and wait for the cloned offspring. Now I'm going to tell you that in cattle, 
of all the cloned embryos that are put back into cows, only three to 5% result in a living offspring. So that's where we're at with cows, let alone all these other fancy species. All right, but, but is it possible? Yes, it is possible. I'm not gonna lie here and say it's not possible. It is very possible. You, if you have what I said, the, the cells, the oocytes, the, your culture protocols and your females, then it, it is a technique that's out there and has a potential to be used for conservation. Will it be used? Probably not. The zoos don't have a mandate to, to use it for offspring production. But look at what we've done with other species. I only need to clone 10 animals and that's not that hard to do to create a new founding genetics. So when people think, oh, but you're gonna take that same animal and clone it 10 times. No, I have 10 different individuals in my bank, hopefully five males, five females, and I clone them and I have my starting population. Again, I'm not saying zoos will do this, but the potential is there to do this. And when you look at the numbers that we now have, 3,000 oryx, 1,000 ferrets, it, it is very easy to take a small, genetically valuable group of animals and breed them out. I'm gonna leave with this because you should all know about this. This is the new world. If you think that cloning can reprogram a cell, then this is the way to go. And again, God bless those basic scientists that want fame and fortune, but they're the ones doing this. So to take fibroblast cells, which we all have in our banks, and to, to induce them to become stem cells. From the stem cells, they can make oocyte and sperm-like cells. They've done uh, in vitro fertilization, they only proven in mice so far, but they do have offspring from these spermatogenic and oogenic like stem cells. So this means you're now not worried about your foreign mitochondrial DNA, you're not worried about the chromosomes and all that. You actually have sperm and oocytes of the species that you want. Okay, you know what, I'm out of time. If anybody wants to talk to me about the work that I actually do, I'm willing to talk about that. My big project's bison. But the reason why I wanted to show it to you is to show you the partnership that we have in Canada and to really, to really hit home, none of this money is coming from conservation groups. It's coming from Agriculture Canada. It's coming from me at the zoo. It's coming from NSERC. I carry an answer grant to do this work. And so when people think us reproductive technologists are taking away from conservation funds, none of us are. We have our gate revenues, we have our own grants. That's how all of this work is being done. And with that, I will finish. <laughs> Sorry, Jackie. Can you take a few questions? Is an arbitrary question. First of all, I want to say that uh, you know philosophers are often accused of having their heads up their asses, but but you guys give no meaning to that. <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean you have head. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I'm not only the worst. I have my head up my ass. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I mean, you say you work on bison. I'm kind of curious about you know, what you think about some, some some folks have sort of proposed to bring back the bison to the. North American Plains, and to, uh, like the, the rewilding, so there are folks who are proponents of rewilding and so on. I don't know if you want to go in that direction. This is unrelated in some respects to some of the stuff you're talking about, but because you're talking about ex situ conservation, it seems to me that I don't know, there's another question related to bison conservation. So, so there is a group in Canada called the Grasslands Initiative, yeah. and they're answering more of those questions. And I participate, again, as what I could bring to the table as a technologist. So I understand that that's what they want to do. Uh, I, and I am afraid I'm not the one to comment. Our curator of mammals could have commented on that a bit better. In, so outside of your capacity as somebody who works at the zoo, yeah. you, oh, you, what's, you not, what's your thought on it? Yeah. You know what, I think today, the, I think this session has taught me, uh, this symposium has taught me that everything I thought was, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe now I'm thinking, okay, let me think about that a little. So right. you're one of the ones I'll buy a beer. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about how the Waza uh, thinks about zoos and their role in conservation? So they have an objective, but that's one of the many. If you have a conservation breeding program, then you must do these things. But are zoos in your, do you feel that zoos are becoming more attuned to conservation? Have they, or or that, has there been any change? Because we think of zoos as being important players. 
but at the same time, like no one's doing so you're supposed to make me like. So unfortunately, I have to admit, every time I heard Zoo mentioned in this symposium, what I was hearing was the zoo of the 80s and 90s. And working in a zoo, it's not like that anymore. And this morning's talk, some of the um, being alluded to yesterday, you are talking about the old zoo. So we're much more in tune to conservation. We resist holding species for cute and fuzzy. Um, of course, our CEOs are all business types and not biologists. Uh, so sometimes we have to cave. And I'm not going to bring up the pandas again, but in my case, that's one. Um, but but no, we, we are a very different beast. So I mentioned to Marty this morning that my boss, my director, loves throwing Kosiwik down our throats, right? He wants to keep us connected, connected. This is what Canada is doing. This is what they think is going to happen 10 years down the line. So it does depend a little bit on the individual directors. But was as a whole, we have a very different mandate. And so, and I saw a lot of papers quoted from 1998. And so maybe... Go talk to some zoo people. We are not that anymore. Uh, thank you so much. I was just wondering, you mentioned a few things about not using anesthetic um, for assisted reproductive technology. So I was just wondering if you could talk about the animal welfare mm -hmm. kind of guidelines around this topic. Yeah. So only for something like artificial insemination, which is non-invasive, uh, it's the same with humans. You don't use anesthesia with humans. We don't with cows and all that. So if the animal is tractable, trainable, and uh, doesn't have an issue with animal ha uh, with human handling, uh, and we can train them to sit for it, uh, then that is the preferred way because anesthesia with non-domestic species has a high risk of them not coming out of it. Um, they come out of it and they're disoriented for an hour. So we do actually try to promote a non-anesthetic non attempt. We take one last, if any, question. No? What? Thanks. Excellent. Thanks.